This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, where I'm speaking to Madeline McKeever, owner of Brown Envelope Seeds. Madeline's company produces organic, open-pollinated seeds, which are harvested from crops grown on site at the Brown Envelope Seeds HQ, a farm in Skibbereen in County Cork. Madeline talks about why open pollinated seeds are essential in the fight to feed people and for greater food biodiversity, the benefits of seed saving and sourcing seeds locally, and how you can harvest your own seeds. I began by asking Madeline how brown envelope seeds came about. Well, it started really as a, as a hobby, you know, and because I was poor, that I, I was a dairy farmer. And I liked gardening and, you know, like growing food for my family. So I would save seeds, partly because I couldn't get things. I spent a couple of years in America and I liked a lot of the things you could get there that really were quite rare here, like squash and beans and things like that. So I just started saving for myself at first. And then, um, yeah, then gradually started selling them on the market. We started a farmer's market in Skibbereen and in the winter I didn't have a lot to sell. So I started selling seeds. Hmm. Okay, and what sort of seeds do you sell now? Well, all kinds of vegetables. Um, I haven't actually counted how many varieties. I just tried to put all the tomatoes on a new set of shelves and they didn't fit. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight by one, two, three, four, five. So there's, a, there's 56 on the shelves and there's another 10 that won't fit on there. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I am a bit obsessed with tomatoes. <laughs> but I also have like all the ordinary things, peas and beans and leeks and onions and... Um, what else? Um, courgettes and squash and cabbages and kales and chilies and herbs and lettuce and yeah, all those sort of all the ordinary vegetables. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and all open pollinated, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. And they're all, they're all grown in Ireland. Like, we, I, I only buy in seeds from, from one other person who's an Irish grower. So they're all Irish grown seeds, which is our unique selling point, really. And if they're kind of grow for us, they should grow for everyone else. Okay. Uh, and so why open pollinated? Well, because I suppose my mission statement initially was to enable people to grow their own food and save their own seeds. So it was more about empowering other people to grow food than um, supplying commercial growers. And uh, now I know I know that some of the some of the hybrids are fantastic for producing and everything, but um, they're not much use to the home grower really. And I think you're all organic as well, aren't you? Yeah, we're certified organic, and so is Jason, who also grows for us. So you state on your website that open pollinated seeds are naturally pollinated by insects or wind, and it's not enforced pollination or inbreeding. And I wondered if you could just explain what you meant by that. Well, I suppose it's, if I explain what a hybrid is, you know, things that aren't hybrids are open pollinated. So if I explain how a hybrid is produced, um, that might make it clear. So that the hybrid is produced by inbreeding two lines of a vegetable. Um, so you keep pollinating it back to itself or a close relative until you essentially have homozygous, you have two sets of chromosomes that are identical on the plant. And then you cross that with a different homozygous plant and so you get your F1 hybrid which has one set of chromosomes from one parent and one set of chromosomes from the other parent but um, all the plants will be pretty much identical whereas in an open pollinated it's more of a population you know that, so that it's um, it's not like comparing it to people because it's, you get into eugenics but it's it's more like having a, a population that um, is, is um, has a bit of variation within it i mean it's still to be a variety it has to be um distinct uniform and stable but it um it would have a certain amount of variability which means it can kind of adapt to climate or it can you know adapt a little bit to the environment and just having that small gene pool make it slightly more fragile in terms of health or future proofing it i guess Yes, it's. I mean, it's like the Cavendish tomatoes now because they're essentially cloned. It's like the Irish potato farm was called really by the fact that most people were growing the same clone of a potato, which is even more, and you know, um, 
now a gene based than, than a hybrid. So it's just dangerous because once a, a disease catches up on it's going to get every single one. So thinking about the pollination, the natural pollination, I'm assuming then that your type of seeds are pretty dependent on the health of the pollinators that are in the surrounding area. So, you know, can that have an impact on seed production? Have you noticed that? Yes. Well, luckily I have a lot of wild pollinators. I mean, we actually have very few honeybees. I mean, we've had some... The population of honeybees is very poor here, but we have a lot of other pollinators, but also a lot of vegetable self-pollination, and they don't need any bees at all. Things like French beans, peas, tomatoes, they all self-pollinate. So it's only that you need pollinators for things like your runner beans, your board beans, and all the cabbagey things. Um, and I, I, so far, I don't have a problem with with pollinators because I live in a kind of wild area, and um, you know, there's a lot of natural vegetation around me, so we seem to have enough to pollinate. Mm. And is it dependent on weather? Does that sometimes affect what pollination takes place? Well, the weather doesn't seem to be that serious. Although some things like broad beans won't start to pollinate very early in the year if it's cold, whether. And obviously there aren't as many bees and things out if it's wet weather, but, you know, they, they seem to get enough pollination. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be one of them. I have plenty of other problems, but pollination isn't one of them. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why is food plant biodiversity a good thing? Well, I think it's a good thing, especially in terms of changing climate, that um, – we need a lot of biodiversity because our summers are getting are different than they were. You know, certainly the springs are later here, the winters are milder and wetter. And you know, I used to be out planting peas and broad beans Patrick's Day. You know, traditionally we plant our potatoes on Patrick's Day here, and also I would try and get my peas and beans, peas and broad beans in in March. But the last few years, it's mid-April before the ground is dry enough, and and now we, we we hardly had a frost here now this winter. I have potatoes up to my knees in the polytunnel because it's been so mild. Yeah, it's um it's definitely very strange. So you were saying you grow obviously your crops in Ireland. Uh having this biodiversity helps in terms of health of the crop, uh, or their resilience in different climates. I mean, I would assume it makes sense if you were going to source open pollinated seeds that you would get them from maybe a supplier who is near you or who was growing in a microclimate similar to yours. But is that not the case, though? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean, I think a lot of the reasons that um, sometimes we buy seeds and they don't do all that well is because they've been grown in warm, sunny places. I mean, most seeds are produced in warm, sunny climates, you know, the Mediterranean and... Israel and North Africa, places like that, is where most of the seeds are grown. And, of course, there's no um, country of origin on seed packets, you know. You know, if you buy a, a, a bunch of radishes, it has to have all kinds of details about where it's grown. But there's no legislation that says you have to say what country a pack of seeds is produced in. So probably, you know, when you're buying, you know, Mr. So-and-so seeds or whatever, they could be coming from anywhere in the world. And you have no way of knowing where they're from. But they're probably coming from somewhere warmer and sunnier than here. That's really interesting. So you would assume that maybe they had not quite so good germination rate or does it does that not get expressed until the actual veg starts growing or, or forming a vegetable? Is that when you see the effect of maybe planting something that was harvested in somewhere very warm and then trying to grow it in the UK? When do you notice that kind of manifested? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a very interesting experiment to um, take some seed, something normal like lettuce, and see and um, germinate it at lower and lower temperatures, selecting only the seeds that grew at low temperature, and I bet it would adapt quite quickly to germination at low temperature. But if you're growing seeds as a commercial seed grower, you just will go, where, where can I grow the most seeds most easily? And you'll say, oh, I think I'll do it in Spain or Italy or somewhere, because it's got a nice climate to do lettuce seeds. Whereas this is a bit of a rubbish climate for doing lettuce seed. I have to do it in a polytunnel because, and even then, I have to overwinter the lettuces and let them flower the following year because if you sow them in the spring, by the time they flower, 
it's sort of the weather is getting it's August, September, and the weather's getting damp and moldy, and they immediately get covered in mold and die. So, um, but I think that by growing lettuce here, I will be adapting it to to, to this climate. Although lettuce is self pollinated, so it's quite inbred, and it's not very there isn't much interest specific interest. You know, there's not much variation within a variety of lettuce because it's so inbred. And does that mean if I was to source some open pollinated seeds that if I buy from uh, Mr. Whoever uh, and I get their packet of seeds, I'm guessing I'm buying because of uniformity and, and you know, resilience maybe to certain diseases and things. Um, if I buy open pollinated seeds, do I necessarily know what I'm getting in that packet then or is there going to be some variation between the plants? Yes. I mean, they should still be within the variety, you know. I mean, if you if you've bought a... A sweet corn that's yellow, it should all be still yellow, you know. <laughs> but I mean, the differences in plants aren't always that obvious. Some of them would be invisible, such as, you know, ability to germinate at low temperature, you wouldn't even see. Should we be aiming to save our own seeds? Absolutely, yes, yes, definitely. Because I think one of the things that between the pandemic and Brexit last year, um, made people realize how fragile the food is. Well, certainly the seed chain was. You know, most of the commercial growers had bought in their seeds and they were okay. But the people were, couldn't, well, certainly here people couldn't get seeds very easily because um, seeds weren't coming over from the UK the way they normally did. And people, since Brexit, people can't here can't order from the UK um, without a lot of phytosanitary kind of paperwork going on. And uh, so it, it meant that we were very busy, and and especially as Northern Ireland in, in people from the North of Ireland can't order from mainland Britain anymore. How is the global seed production industry? And and you know, if you think about the big seed sellers, what does the face of of seed production look like at the moment? Well, we're not really in touch with it because you know, I'm in touch with more of the small independent seed producers because they 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 are we are all actually quite in touch with with each other. Going, what's going on? Because um, you have you have some some great small independent seed companies in the UK, such as Vital Seeds and Real Seeds and the Co-op, um, all producing uh, you know chemical free and organic seeds um, and sourcing them locally as well. So that you know, whereas if you go to the the bigger seed companies, you you don't know where they're getting this. They're buying their seeds on the world market, and it's hard to know what's going on in the world market because kind of the really big seed companies that produce ninety nine percent of the seed don't really tell you what's going on. And is there an issue with GM seeds as well if you're kind of buying from a bigger company? Well, not really. Because, well, look. Possibly, and the main things that are GM are corn and soya beans. So that unless the corn accidentally could get crossed in, if it was grown in the country, you know, which we don't have any GM in Ireland that we know of. And actually, there's nobody really growing corn very close to me, so I'm not particularly worried about that. And I don't, I don't grow soya beans. I've never had much success with them. But I mean, there are only a very few kind of species that are being grown as GM, cotton and corn and soya, the main ones, which we don't grow much of around here. So if I was going to save my own seeds in my head, I'm assuming that my crop is going to get better and better each year because I'm selecting the strongest or I'm selecting for traits that are valuable to me. If maybe there was a bad year, that might affect my my seed stock, for example, or the quality of it. Um, Apart from that, what else should I be looking for if I am going to save seed myself? Well, save seeds from the best plant, obviously, because the, the temptation is you go out to get some leeks to make some supper and you pick the biggest leeks. But if you're a seed saver, you're leaving the biggest leeks and you're eating the small leeks. And uh, you don't let anyone else go out and pick the leeks for you because <laughs> you're, you're always trying to, they, they get afraid of you soon enough and they don't bother trying. But, um, <laughs> you, you're always leaving the good ones and, and you get into the habit of it quite quickly, of being more concerned about the seed than tomorrow's dinner like I'm buying carrots now rather than dig up the ones I need for seed so which is fine I don't care I'm, I'm glad I have my best seeds already replanted my best carrots already replanted for seed next year yeah so what do you do do you like to hire red ribbon around the ones that you want to keep no well no we dig them all up well because again because the climate is not optimal for carrot seed production 
we dig up the carrots and select the best ones, like the ones that are nice and straight and smooth and have the least green at the top. And um, you, you just look for the prettiest carrots, really, and also good size. And then I, I, I replant them in the polytunnel to go to seed. But I do, I've left one variety outside to go to seed outside because I've had some success with it outside before, but I have had very little success with carrot seed outdoors. And I think most people in the UK would be doing the carrot seed in the, in the greenhouse. It's, it's, it's what we have to do in this climate. And that's because it's a biennial and it won't survive over the winter otherwise? No, it'll survive over the winter. But what happens is, is that the summer isn't really warm enough for it outside. And it will produce some seed, but very often the plants will get covered in mould and the seeds will kind of fall off and you will just get a very small amount of seed. But I'm trying to harden up. I have one variety that was for a German variety called Radelica that um, has outperformed almost any other carrot I've ever tried. Um, it, it, it's bred by a biodynamic plant breeder called... Um, Oh, I can't think of his name. But he's been growing this carrot since the 1960s. He's in his 80s now, and he tastes every single carrot. And producing the elite seed for it, he tastes every single carrot he puts back in the ground. And it's a fantastic variety. So, And I have certain, some success with outdoors, so I'm doing it outdoors this year, and I'll do a different one in the polytunnel, which is half a mile away. Yeah, because I guess if you don't dig them up, you don't know what they look like anyway, so you, you kind of need to get exactly. them out. Yeah. yeah. Huh. I never thought about that. That's amazing. You need to, like, see through containers <laughs> to grow them in. <laughs> yes, a lot of people have a light bulb moment when, you know, with seed saving because it hasn't dawned on them that where are the seeds on a carrot that you have to put it back in the ground for a second year? Or with a cabbage, you have to leave a cabbage there or an onion. It takes two years, you know. Are there any plants that are particularly difficult? When you were speaking then, I thought about the carrot seed and like you were saying, they drop off. Are there any that are particularly difficult to harvest the seeds off because they just ping off or they drop? Well, that's not really the problem. That the, Some that I have problem, it's like basil has my heart broken because I can, can grow perfectly nice basil. But again, the, the plants go kind of black and moldy before the seed is ripe. I've got about two teaspoons of basil seed this year that seems to be germinating. Another thing that I find, I don't know why, but I grow aubergine seed every year and 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 it won't germinate um, properly. I have some of it germinating reasonably well this year from one variety. I grew three varieties and only one variety is producing seed that's viable. And I don't know why. It's still a mystery to me. Is it not mature enough? Do I not dry it quickly enough? Do I dry it too much? I don't know. But most things are pretty simple. Most things are are really just kind of common sense, you know. What happens with the crops? Obviously, you said you eat them, but you're producing presumably quite a lot of vegetables. Do you eat everything that doesn't get the seed harvested from it? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes you just have way too much of something and uh, you either give it away or feed it to the animals or something. Yeah, yeah, that's the beauty of having animals, I suppose. Um, so... I was just going to ask you, really, if you were kind of thinking about it, obviously basil, yeah, I've got the same problem. I grow lovely, especially purple basil in the polytunnel, but by the time the seed's ready, it's got botrytis or it's just looking manky or it's gone soggy. Uh, So I do feel your pain. What are some of the easier ones to save seed from if you wanted to? Well, I think tomatoes are always a great place to start because they don't cross with each other much. I mean, they do an odd time cross, but very little really. And I mean, the simpler you can, you can the, the easy thing you can do is just squeeze a bit of the, your favourite tomato onto a, a bit of kitchen paper or something like that, and put it on the windowsill to dry, and write its name on it, and that's next year's seed sorted. Or if you want to do it more fancy, you can ferment them and clean them up and. And um, you'll have much easier seeds to handle. But, I mean, most people only want 10 tomato seeds for next year so that, you know, you can just squeeze a few onto the kitchen towel and and dry it. Um, so they're a very easy place to start. Peas and French beans are very easy too because, again, they self-pollinate. You don't have to worry about them crossing with other things. Um, anything that's insect-pollinated is more difficult because they can get inbreed bred if you don't have a big enough population. So something like cabbages, you really want to be letting at least 50 of them go to seed, which is pretty impractical for the average gardener. And a lot of people would say 200. Like for for beetroots, I would say 100 you'd need at least beetroots at a time to go to seed. 
I mean, you'll still get beetroots the first year, but the variety will deteriorate if you inbreed it too much. I think probably a lot of people know about things like courgettes and squashes and about how they cross uh, to give you something that's not necessarily edible. Is there anything else you need to watch out for like that? Well, you can grow three squashes at a time because there's like three species. Well, there are more, but there are three common species of squashes. You've got your courgette one, which is pipo, but that also includes your Halloween pumpkins and a few other things. But um, if you just do, say, a courgette, a butternut and some kind of maxima, which is like a, a shikikuri or, uh, you know, one of those winter hard ones. They're all three different species, so they won't cross with each other. As a general rule, you have a look at the Latin names. And it also depends on your neighbours. Like, luckily, I don't have much in the way of gardening neighbours so that I'm not worried about my neighbours squash pollinating mine. But, you know, I can do, in the same tunnel, I can do a courgette, I can do a butternut, and I can do, say, um, a blue curry or something like that. Mm. Yeah, so it probably wouldn't work maybe if you were on an allotment or something. Well, no, but you can tie the flowers. What you can do then is, that, especially if you're just saving for yourself and you only need 10 seeds for next year, you can select the, the earliest best plant and when you see a female fruit um, forming, put a little twisty tie or a bit of masking tape around the flower so it can't open. And on the day that it should open, you can open. You can find a male flower from a different plant of the same variety, and untie your sticky tape and pollinate it, and then tie it up again, and mark label it. Of course, so you know which one it is, and leave it to mature, and then it can't cross with any old squash in the neighbourhood. Cool. That's excellent advice. Um, so, is there anything you're particularly excited about growing next year? Have you got anything new out? I'm thinking probably tomatoes. Well, I love loads of tomatoes. What else am I excited? I, have, I grew a few lentils this year. I'll actually probably run out of them very soon. And um, anything that I'm excited about seems to be running out very fast. But I mean, really, I think that, you know, people get the best value out of the most ordinary vegetables. You know, for children, children love peas and uh, everyone loves a fresh bean. You know, th- things like parsnips are easy enough to grow, beetroot is easy enough to grow. Um, I, you know, sometimes people buy too much fancy stuff and it doesn't really grow that well. You know, if you're in a tunnel, you can grow your tomatoes and peppers and aubergines and things. But if you're an outdoor gardener, I think you're better sticking with, the, you know, the, the old reliables that your granny grew, cabbage and beets and parsnips and onions and, yeah, salads. Well, salads are always great too. The best value per square yard in your salads. Mm, yeah, very true. They're very cost effective. In terms of cabbages, how do you keep the caterpillars off those? Do you cover them? I don't have a huge problem with cabbage butterflies. I've got some other problems with cabbages. Like I've got an awful lot of cabbage root flies. But I don't actually have a huge butterfly problem because not that many people grow cabbages around here anymore. And so I did have a bit of a problem this year, but it, I have much worse problem with cabbage root fly and with aphids on them when they're flowering. And does that disrupt the seed production? Yeah, sometimes they get so covered in aphids that they're just, they're just the flowers just all kind of rot off. That's be irritating. Imagine getting it, growing this amazing show veg to get the seed from, and right at the last moment you get thwarted. Must be very, very frustrating. At the same time, when it does work, you get so much seed, it's so abundant that, you know, I never have everything every year, but I, you know, I keep working away at the things that I don't have. And um, so we have, a, we have, a, we have lots of different varieties. We haven't got everything, but we have lots of different things. Excellent. And if people do want to find you and get some seeds, where would they do that? And um, they can go to www.brownenveloppeseeds.com, and they can um, order a catalogue from there if they want. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Well, that is it, Madeline. I've got to the end of my questions. Have we covered everything you wanted to? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I also want to just tell you about my other website too that I've just started and um, it's just starting to get going. Is I've, I've put up, I've had a, a multi vendor site set up called seedy.ie. It's S E E D I E dot I E, which is a bit confusing. And the spell check is always turning it into a Y, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the CD with a Y was gone, the, the, the domain name. So it, it's a seed site you can sign up. You can message me from there if you want to sell your seeds on my site. And um, 
I've got several growers I've got, have their seeds up and they can, they're selling them now from that site. Thank you very much to Madeline for speaking to us, to you for listening, and to listener Michael Mayo for recommending Madeline as a guest. I've added the links to Brown Envelope Seeds, to Madeline's other website, cd.ie, and to a previous episode I recorded with the late Isaiah Levy of the Seed Share Project, which you might enjoy listening to if you're interested in seed saving and food security. Now here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a truly hardy winter bug. Travelling down a country lane on a cold winter's night, you may be surprised to see in the glare of your lights a moth flying along a frost-encrusted hedgerow. This might seem unusual. Since this time of year, creatures from the bug world should be in the dormant stage of their lives, hidden away from the bleak and often savage winter weather. And particularly since Lepidopterans are assumed to be highly susceptible to sub-zero temperatures. So what are these moths doing, flying around and apparently risking their lives? Well, amongst the two and a half thousand moth species in Britain, there's a couple that have evolved to use the frigid season of dormancy to quietly get on with their lives. Unsurprisingly, these are called the winter moths. From November through to late February, winter moths emerge from the ground, where they patiently waited as pupae since early June. Using a process called endothermy, they generate heat within their bodies, which protects them from the fatal effects of freezing and allows them to remain active. The new males unfold their light brown wings and take to the air, whilst the flightless females climb up the trunks of nearby trees, where they release chemical signals to attract the males into mate. Once mated, the males soon die, whilst the females begin laying their eggs into nooks and crannies on the bark. When completed, the females then tumble to the ground and also die. During March, before the frosts have ended, but when the leaf buds on many trees begin to break open, tiny caterpillars begin hatching from the eggs within the bark. Blown by the wind, they're dispersed and begin feeding on the emerging leaves of many different tree species. As they grow, they become one of the most important food sources for the blue tits, who have evolved to coincide their first brood with the presence of the winter moth caterpillars collecting around a hundred every day for each of their chicks. So, for sustaining the essential food webs within our ecosystems, these humble little moths, with their unique ability to remain active during the harshest of winters, have a very important role to play. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast 